You're watching the New Stack Makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more information and articles about at scale technologies, please visit thenewstack.io. Now enjoy the show. Since its inception, Amazon Web Services, AWS, has been the best place for customers to build and run open source software in the cloud. AWS is proud to support open source projects, foundations, and partners. Hey, Kyle. Hey. Hey, I'm here with Kyle Davis, who is a senior developer advocate of open source Valky at Amazon Web Services. That's right. People will know Valky as the in-memory data store, which is also a fork of Redis. And we're here at All Things Open, the conference, and we're talking about the latest in Valky, the 8.0 release, and looking at also at 8.1, and further into uh, 9.0. Glad to talk about it. Sounds good? Yeah, sounds great. Cool. I want to learn a little bit about you, though. I mean, sure. You know, how did you get started as a developer? There's so many people here at this conference who are pretty young and yeah. getting started. I was, so I'm curious about your story. Yeah, I had a misspent youth uh, developing software. I think the earliest that I, I can call it back to was like below five years old. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. There's a picture of my dad and I in front of a Texas Instruments like home computer, which had all of 16K of RAM. And wow. we were working on that. And I distinctly remember working with graph paper to like, make a little horse that would run across the screen with him. Uh huh. I don't think I was very useful, but by like age nine, I was writing software. And I remember I released some software, open source. This was like the 90s, wasn't as known. Yeah. I had some public domain software. And it was like an interpreter for uh, a language. And I uh, put it online at, on a BBS before the internet was common. And I got a phone call about it. And somebody was like, hey, uh, I'm interested in your software. We want to you know, do something about that. And I started talking to him, and he said, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm 13. Uh, I got a contract off of it. So I've been writing software professionally since I was like 13, 13 years, years old. old. Yeah, yeah. But I've, I've been all over the industry. Did doing you go that. to college? I did, yeah. And in fact, I actually used to work uh, uh, in higher education for a while. I didn't do like computer science in college. I, I kind of rebelled against it, but I've always written software for as long as I can What'd remember. What'd you study? Oh, uh, gosh. So my degree was in telecommunications. Ah. But I, yeah, had nothing to do with that. And then I did, got a graduate degree in a very obscure field called college student personnel administration. Okay. Yeah, and so I was, my, it was building intentional communities at universities and colleges. Ah. And it actually kind of dovetails into what I'm doing now where I'm building like intentional communities around software. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, the community aspects of open source are very well known. Yeah. Like, how would you describe the Valky community today? Oh, yeah. So, you know, Valky community is really interesting because we have such a variety of people from both around the world um, and at very di different, um, you know, companies and organizations that are working on it. And it's really interesting because there's just kind of a common cause to, to move this software forward. Um, so it's really see, interesting to see everybody kind of bring their own things to the table. Um, and then we have this great set of users that are really interested in it and kind of moving their projects into something that it's like a really great open source project they know that will be open source for as long as possible and into the future. So what's the mix of like people who work for software companies versus those who are just kind of contributing to it? Oh, that's a really great question because when we started working on Valky, which is of course is a fork, right? Yeah. Um, we had people that kind of came out of the woodwork and, and the top contributor uh, to Valky at one point with somebody, I kind of went to people that I did know. I was like, what company does this person work for? And they all kind of went, I don't know. C come to find out, it was a guy kind of like really interested in the project, working out of Vietnam. And he was just like the biggest contributor for like a couple of weeks, right? But he was just so interested in it and found it so interesting to work on it. So we had people that we, that just kind of drove by, found the project and contributed a lot of code to it. So it really makes a, a huge difference that we can have people from yeah, it doesn't matter where you're from, right? It, so who are some of the companies that you see as major contributors then? Yeah, so uh, Valky works on a system where we have a technical steering committee. Yeah. And the technical steering committee has uh, six members right now. Um, the six members are from AWS, they're from Google, they're from Ericsson, they're from Alibaba, from Huawei, and Tencent. So those are the technical steering committee members. They, they make the hard decisions. And then we have other organizations that are contributing, so companies like Oracle, Percona, 
uh, Ivan. These are all great companies that are kind of putting forward various different resources towards it um, and, and making the project what it is. So um, you know, these are all folks that, that uh, have put forward significant uh, amount of uh, effort towards the project. Are they the major users of this of the Valky ta- uh, code? Uh, you know, some of them are users. Some of them are forward-looking. Like, you know, I know uh, last I talked to Oracle, like they currently uh, are moving towards Valky, but they haven't got there yet, right? So they, they're investing in their future uh, for it. But other organizations are using it in a very high scale. Like, I, you know, AWS, for example, I work at AWS, but I work only for the Valky project. Um, you know, we have a service based on it. Google also has a service based on it. So these are really uh, important folks. But we also have somebody like Ericsson, which doesn't offer a service. Like they're, they're using it for their own products. Like they, of course, Ericsson's working on things like cell towers, right? And they're, they're putting it in cell towers and they're making these plans to move forward with it uh, from there because they have a big investment in, in those various pieces. But, you know, it's open source. So we really sometimes don't even know who our biggest user is. We yeah, right. have somebody using How- it. How's AWS using it then? Yeah, so AWS, like I said, has a service called Elastic Cash. Yeah. They just launched a few weeks ago their Valky service. So it's for users who um, want to uh, deploy their own in memory data store. Um, and they can just, uh, you know, now spin that up as a new engine in that service. Uh, Redis has historically uh, served, you know, a pretty large community. And now with Valky, you've taken the what existed in Redis and you're building on top of it. Yeah. And I know you've been trying to differentiate a little bit with uh, Valky, and you now are at your 8.0 release. Yeah. And a major aspect of it is the multi-threading. Yeah. I've worked at Redis for a long time, and I've been with using Redis since 2012, which doesn't seem like 2012 should have been you know 12 years ago, but... It's it's a crazy yeah. it is. That's and been, you worked there, right? I did work there. I was yeah. doing advocacy there as well. Yeah. Um, but what we think about that, um, Redis was developed in you know the late two thousands, early two thousand ten. Yeah. Um, the software the the software was built in a way that mirrored the hardware that was available at the time. Right. Um, architecturally, it's based on what's called an event loop, and the software would just do a little bit and then go to the next thing and run the next thing. Consequently, it was single threaded. Um, and that matched what was available at the time. Uh, threads were pretty um, rare, right? Like now we work on these multi-threaded CPUs that have so many options to utilize it. That's where the CPU has really grown or the co- silicon has really grown for it. So we're now kind of modernized what we inherited from Redis and what Valky 725, which our initial release, uh, our 724, our original release, um, by adding multi-threading to the I.O., uh, it's an important differentiation from uh, entirely multi-threaded architectures. I see, because the I/O is really that. You know, that's the point where it goes out. Right? It is. You know, it comes in, right? Yeah. So it's like almost like that end of the funnel, really. Yeah. You know? it, it, the the interesting thing to me is when they evaluated how much time Valky was spending on doing different things. Most of it was actually I/O. By looking at that and dis- making that kind of discovery that I.O. was the bottleneck in the process, we were able to preserve the same data model. Because if you have a database that's multi-threaded, it changes a lot of things about it. Your guarantees and you don't have data contention, somebody tries to write to the same thing at the same time, that's a problem. So keeping Valky single-threaded in its uh, data loop, the event loop still works the same way, but then being able to fan out to multiple threads for I.O. is a total game changer for uh, the performance that you can achieve out of, out of the database. Why, why did it have that bottleneck? Uh, yeah, you know, I think that it really was just kind of w- when it was built. Like, that was the most optimal way of doing it in 2009, 10, 11, 12. We're no longer in that time. You know, the, the underlying processors have really just advanced. And in that time period, it would have been unthinkable just to use the cores or the threads for I.O. But now we have this, and turns out that the way we can do this, it can make it a lot more efficient to spend that time on I.O. Um, so it was a big change in the, that, but it doesn't actually change anything for the users. It just makes it faster, which is really cool. So how did, what did you have to do to change it? Yeah, so it required kind of like separating out a lot of the, the process, right? So it was much simpler before to just, you know, we have a single thread that manage both the data and the I.O. 
but by changing and splitting that out, it did create the a, a, a little bit more of a complex, uh, you know, source code. But that was worth it when it came to the amount of changes, right? So basically, you had to cordon off all the I/O, bring that in, then find a way to to make those changes in a way that wouldn't be, you know, serviceable to a user that like they wouldn't notice the difference, right? Um, so that was where the big the big change was. And what did that require? What kind of resources did you have to pull in to do that? And what were the technology kind of changes that you made out of that? Everybody has looked at Redis and been, can, can we make it multi-threaded? And when Valky had the opportunity, they were able to t- pull in some you know, stuff that other companies and organizations have been kind of having on the back burner for a long time. So it came together very quickly. You know, April is when Valky first came out. And the multi-threading was one of the first things that we really looked at doing. So that came together really quickly because it was just kind of a pent-up demand. Uh, so we had, you know, just a lot of people who focused that. We knew that was early on going to be a differentiating feature. So you didn't have to, you didn't change the whole multi-threading capability of Redis. It's just the I/O. That's right. And so when you when you do that, what are you changing? Yeah. So it only really comes down to changing. Uh, the individual parts inside the source code, right? Um, and like I was saying before, like if you have a multi-threaded database, you have things that are like locking and all that stuff. Fortunately, with I/O, we can basically take that and fan out to the individual I/O threads and not have to change much at all. Because once it's already at I/O, that means that you know you don't have to make any changes. That's already something that would be considered gone from the from the database perspective. Um, so it really wasn't, it was a source code level change. We didn't have to bring any extra dependencies in. So it was kind of really a no-brainer. What is the source code lever change that you made? Well, I mean, it was going through and uh, looking at actually how we changed the C source code of Valky. Um, individual line numbers, I couldn't tell you. Um, but uh, when we did look at it, it was like the individual parts that would um, typically have been a very sim- simple system call to underlying Unix code. Um, now it's something that we had to do a little bit more of a dance there to get it to make that and then come back to the data loop and make the and keep going on it. Yeah, because when it's in the C layer, that's pretty deep down. It is, yeah. And so, you know, as I understand, just like looking at different technology architectures such as PyTorch, right? Yeah. One of the changes they made in PyTorch, they said, hey, you know, one reason we wanted to move to Python is because you can see the graph change immediately, yeah. right? But when it was in C++, you had to dig through a lot of stuff. So that was that part. Of, I mean, I don't know if there's an analogy there, but it seems like when you're using C at you know much lower, you know, lower in the stack, that becomes a little bit well, more challenging. Well, so, it's a good point, but you know, Valky is written almost entirely in C, so it's relatively right. unique in oh, in, in this, wow. right? Um, because some of you say, well, why wouldn't you write it in Java? Why wouldn't you write it in Python? Why wouldn't you write these things? Right. Because every little millisecond matters. Ah. Uh, and so we've written in systems programming languages. I mean, I think right now there is some effort to bring in other system programming languages like Rust. But when we're dealing with milliseconds, we can't wait on... So interpret- that's why you keep it in C. That's right. Ah, interesting. So you had to change that lever, which really fit its purpose for many years. But now you had to change that. What did you do to change it to make it faster if it's just a lever then? Yeah, no, it was basically abstracting out all the I.O. code, so things actually interface. Okay, what you were mentioning before. So abstracting that away and then being able to maintain the data loop, which is still, yeah. You also um, have been working on memory gains. Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah, so, you know, Valky is one of those things that um, oftentimes is bound by the amount of memory that you need because it's an in-memory storage engine, right? It's an in-memory database. So one of the big things people have is they will fill up their entire yeah. RAM with all the yeah. data. So anything we can make a, a difference there right. is hugely impactful. And Valky is a key value database. That's where the name comes from, Valky, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the keys are all stored in RAM. And that ends up being actually a significant portion. So that's the way you reference data right. in Valky. Um, Come to find out that if we change the data structure, which we have a dictionary effectively right, for all the yes. keys, we could find a we could find several bytes on every single key. Right. And depending on the ratio of you know the key size to the data size, sometimes you can have very large keys and actually a relatively small amount of data. Um, 
you can get huge benefits by making tweaks to that data structure. So we changed the data structure a little bit um, for that key dictionary, got a few bytes per key, and that can end up being up to like 20% uh, more memory efficient. So what you were storing in Valky 725, suddenly you have 20% extra RAM when you move to Valky 8, or 20% extra storage capacity. So it can make a big difference for a lot of folks. And that translates to infrastructure, right? When you can do that, if you're CPU or memory bound, not CPU bound, um, you can use less infrastructure to get the same goals for your data. And so how did that get done? What did you need to do? I mean, yeah. you were changing the, you know, the, the dictionary, so to speak, right? Yeah. And changing the keys so it could handle more bytes? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're using, effectively, basically found overhead, right? Where there was some well, yeah. ways that it was being referenced that were wasting, and like, in What's 2024. Some, what, what is some of the more common overhead that you see? Well, I mean, it's every uh, piece of data has to have metadata about yeah, it, right. right? Like, when yeah. it was stored, how it right. was stored. Uh, and then the data structure itself has metadata as well, right? Yeah, so yeah. So how the... Um, the data works inside yeah. the dictionary. All those things take up precious bytes. Right. And it's 2024. We're, we're talking about bytes here, you know, yeah. eight little bits, but that matters when you get to hundreds and thousands and millions of keys. Because uh, everyone's producing keys. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So just refactoring that, changing the, the way we organize that, how the metadata was packed into it, made a big difference in the amount of storage that required for the, the key set. Um, so that key space reduction really made a big d impact there. So you can see where that would really, you know, before you were just basically wasting bytes, um, and now we're able to pack it in more efficiently. How does the user see the difference? Just more and more, it's just a faster, better experience. Yeah, exactly. Um, so a couple things, like we're talking about multi-threading, right? right. Um, there is some key advantages uh, with multi-threading, uh, you may want to reconfigure how your cluster is set up, right? Uh, because you could have a more efficient individual node in the cluster where you before were maybe doing more individual uh, nodes in the cluster. Now you can have bigger nodes, which was kind of an anti-pattern in the past. Um, so that's something you might want to look at. You don't change anything. You don't really, you don't hurt by anything. The memory efficiency, on the other hand, is you migrate to Valky 8 and you look at the utilization and suddenly it's lower. You know, that is a, a change that you don't really have to have any ah, downside to do, right. right? So just imagine if you like open your laptop and it's completely full, you, there's an update. Usually that means things are worse, but now you open your update after a, like an update and it suddenly you have free space. Like it's just kind of like- Yeah, it's like, yeah. Why not, right? And that's all just because of clever, clever use of data structures, clever use of optimizations. Uh, got us just that up to 20% uh, gain in memory efficiency. I wanted to ask then about 8.1 and 9.0. We have a few minutes left. Yeah. What are some of the highlights that are coming out of 8.1 and looking forward to 9.0? Yeah, so uh, the way Valky works as far as its versioning, uh, we're looking at doing about two versions a year. So we'll do a, a major and a minor. Uh, we just have Valky 8 for 2020. That's a major. Yeah, it's a major. And then 2025, first part of that, we're going to look like 8.1. Um, and that'll bring in some new features, but no big breaking changes, no, no changes. Okay. Um, so we're looking at a few different things that will actually enhance it through modules. Uh, Valky has the ability to extend the, the database through modules. Um, one of those is a, a JSON module. So you can be able to take JSON in its natural form, um, then go ahead and put that into... Uh, Valky, and then you can operate on that JSON without having to deserialize or serialize it again. So if you want to make a deep change into it, you can make that deep change, retrieve things back. Um, so that's actually really great because a lot of what we work with today is JSON, right? JSON data. The other things we're looking forward to uh, is a Bloom filter module. Bloom filters are a probabilistic data structure for testing presence. Uh, we're implementing a Bloom filter module for 8.1. And then kind of further into the future, uh, there's a lot of talk about a vector similarity search module. Uh, there's currently some implementations of that in some of the different companies that support Valky. We're kind of merging those together into something that's reasonable right now. Uh, and so vector similarity search, it's not my particular area, uh, but it's oftentimes used to support AI models. So 
What is it exactly? That, so vectors are basically... I, mean, we, I know what vectors are, yeah. right? So the similarity finds the similarities in the vectors? That's right, yeah. Uh, effectively, this comes from the idea that you can use and moving Valky from less being key-based to basically being able to in, uh, query the data that's at the keys. Right. In a key-value database, you're always looking at the actual key first. Uh, anytime you have uh, something like a vector similarity search, you're able to search through the vectors themselves okay. and then find where they are similar, right? So in 9.0, what can we see? So 9.0 is interesting, and, and this is all kind of like get my yeah. crystal ball out, you know, yeah. it's pretty far into the future. I think we're going to see more fundamental changes to the system. What I hear a lot of people talk about is, you know, changes to how the cluster is going to work. Um, again, we have a cluster that was made in the, you know, early teens. Right. Um, and now moving that cluster to use things more efficiently, maybe uh, change some of the properties around the cluster itself will be kind of that big change. And one of the things, though, that I think it's important to know is the way Valky operates as far as continuity that's not going to be something that you're required to adopt, right? right? So you'll be able to maybe adopt this new version of the clustering method, and that will give you better properties for the cluster. I get it. So I think that's going to be the big change for folks. But again, it's not something that you're going to go and wake up tomorrow morning, have to go change to nine and nothing works. It's just something that you can adopt and will enhance what you already have uh, if you cho so choose to do it. I guess my last question is, now, what do you see most people using in the new Valky? What version are they are you, they using? It's all over the place a little bit. There's still a big usage for Valky 7.2x because that is functionally the same as Redis was. So that's a place where somebody can initially jump to. Um, but we're going to see a lot of people adopt 8. When I look at like the wide distribution of Valky, Valky is available in every Linux distribution that I can think of, right? Either it's on its way or already there. I can look and see right. all the versions that they're adopting. And so we can see Valky 8 being the, going forward, we're not going to uh, update to any of the Valky 7 uh, 2x versions. So that's going to automatically kind of coerce people into adopting Valky 8, right? Uh, I, yeah, I guess that's my next to last question, because the last question I did want to ask is about distributions and what you're seeing with the distributions of Valky. Yeah. I saw Ubuntu, for example, now is adopted yeah. Valky. Yeah, and this is really an interesting point. Um, we've really been embraced by the Linux community um, because they had been distributing Redis in a long time. Yeah. Now they're looking to Valky. They can't distribute uh, something that's not open source. So they're looking at Valky. Um, but what's really cool about it is it's even a, a deeper integration. Like We are basically um, using that as a kind of first class way of distributing Valky. Uh, because we, we found a lot of open source projects have something that's like, you know, install it from your Linux distribution. And so it's really uh, the project making those ties in the packaging community means that we're going to be able to move this forward and move the whole industry forward. We'll see other open source projects be able to adopt Valky as kind of their standard moving forward. And I think you're going to see a lot of growth from Valky uh, from the other open source projects that use it as an external dependency. Kyle, thank you so much for taking the time to talk. Yeah. Great. My pleasure. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.